All right, welcome to the course overview for group theory. I am very excited to be making a new video series, and this is always the, the starting point for that video series, right? Where we first talk about the prerequisites and then the course outline. So first things first, let's just go through the prerequisites. And really, I would say that the prerequisites aren't that bad. We should have a good understanding of of basic algebra that got taught in middle school and high school. But I wanna emphasize that there is no calculus required. So if you haven't taken calculus yet, that's okay. You can still follow along. That being said though, I would also argue that numbers and sets is required. And what I mean by numbers and sets is just the, the first video series that, that got put up on this channel. But really why numbers and sets is required is because group theory is typically an area of math that falls under the umbrella term of pure math. And in order to do pure math, you need to know how to prove mathematical statements. And then there's a lot of notation that gets introduced in pure math. So when I say that numbers and sets is required, what I really mean is that you wanna make sure you know how to prove statements and you have some basic understanding of pure math notation, like how to denote an element of a set and stuff like that. But if you have that, then, then I would say that's, this requirement would get checked off. Now for the, the course outline, what is actually going to get covered? So first thing that we should probably want to answer in a course on group theory is, well, what is a group, right? And a group is a set that has an operation equipped with it that satisfies a relatively small list of axioms. And if you put all those together, you get this thing called a group. And we're gonna first introduce, well, what is that? We're gonna list out what all those axioms are and to describe some of those basic properties. Then we're gonna talk about how can we map between different groups? How can we learn about functions that go from one group into another? And that's essentially what a homomorphism is. A homomorphism is a, a function between groups that preserves the overall structure of a group. So just learning about the, the very basics about what groups are and how to map between them is what we're going to be doing right here. Then we're going to really jump into things uh, pretty much, I guess, from, from here on out. Now, if you had to describe what group theory is in a nutshell to somebody who has never taken group theory, has no idea what group theory is, I would say that group theory is the study of symmetries, okay, which is kind of like a... a an aesthetically nice thing to, to imagine. But in case we're not familiar with what a symmetry is, and maybe I'll just draw something here really quickly. A symmetry is essentially, we can visualize a symmetry as an action that is performed on an object that leaves that object unchanged. So in this example, if I have a triangle right here and I have this axis, this axis right here, I could rotate this triangle about 180 degrees and you can imagine if I rotated it 180 degrees, the triangle would look the same as before I rotated it. So therefore we would say a rotation by 100 deg 180 degrees about this axis would be a symmetry of this triangle. And group theory really, in a nutshell, is the study of, of symmetries. And because of that, we are going to be very interested then in the group that looks at all possible symmetries. Of a, uh, of a set that has a certain size. And then that's called the symmetric groups. Okay. So we're gonna learn about this all important class of groups. And then next thing is we're gonna talk about this thing called Lagrange's theorem. It turns out that you can not just have groups, but you can have groups within groups. And the groups that are contained within a larger group are called subgroups. And one thing that we can often be interested in is to say, okay, if we have a group of a certain size, what are the possible subgroups that it could have? What are the groups that are contained within the overall group? And Lagrange's theorem provides an immediate answer to that question, to say, if it has a subgroup, then its possible sizes are gonna be this, 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 and this. So it is a nice compact way of understanding the, the overall rich structure of a group. Then, next thing, we're gonna move on to quotient groups. 
So Lagrange's theorem can be used to talk about a general subgroup for a given group. But quotient groups really start off with a special type of subgroup called a normal subgroup. And it turns out that if we have a group and we have a normal subgroup contained within it, then we can effectively divide the two to obtain what is called a corresponding quotient group. And quotient groups are interesting in their own right, but the primary reason, at least for this video series, for why we're interested in quotient groups is because they get used in a theorem called the isomorphism theorem. And it is this incredibly useful theorem that gets used very often in proving various statements in abstract algebra. So really what, what this section is gonna be all about is, is developing the framework that's necessary to talk about the isomorphism theorem. And I should mention too that there are, there are multiple isomorphism theorems. This video series, because it's more of an introductory one, we're only gonna be covering the first isomorphism theorem. And I think that's already a lot within itself. Okay, next we're gonna move on to group actions. So if we were to think about group theory as the study of symmetries, the study of actions that leave an object appearing to be unchanged, then it's, it could be useful to imagine having an element of a group act on a set, some general set. And, and that's how we can think of a group action. And in doing that, we're gonna define these various concepts called orbits and stabilizers and those are going to get combined together in a very conveniently named theorem called the orbit stabilizer theorem. And this is going to be very useful in, in also determining sizes of, of groups and subgroups. Okay, so a lot of good stuff up until this point. And once we get to this point, this is about the point where we are going to be covering general theory type of stuff. Then once we get down to here, these last two uh, sections, that is going to be applying a lot of the theory that we've been developing in here into these two specific categories. The, the first is looking or taking a second look at symmetric groups because in talking about group actions, we're gonna be looking at different types of group actions. It turns out that there's not just one type of action. And one of the important actions we're gonna be talking about is the conjugate action. And when talking about the conjugate action, uh, there's a concept that also gets naturally introduced called conjugacy classes. And understanding the conjugacy classes of symmetric groups is going to be the main focus um, in this section. And not just the symmetric groups. I should say the symmetric groups and its, its natural subgroup called the alternating group. Okay. And then finally, in the last section, we're gonna say, okay, let's just look at some other important groups that are gonna show up not just in math, but also in, in physics and in various other areas that, that we might be interested in. So we're gonna be looking at the general linear group, the special orthogonal group, we're gonna look at unitary groups, the Mobius group, and all these fun other important groups and specific examples to where we can apply this general framework to, to study uh, study these structures that show up in other areas of math and physics. So hopefully this makes sense. I hope that you guys are excited as I am to, to jump into this new video series. And I guess one more thing that I want to mention in this final section on, on examples of groups, we're gonna be talking about matrix groups. So inherently we wanna know what matrices are, which would require an understanding of linear algebra. So I am making not just this video series, but also a linear algebra video series simultaneously. And it might be a bit ambitious, but that's, that's what the plan is, at least for now. So, so make sure that by the time you get to here, we have at least a basic understanding of what matrices are in order to understand, I'd say this final subtopic right here. But yeah, thanks so much for watching and I, I really hope to see you guys in the upcoming video series.